I'm An Soon Wing. I'm your facilitator. I am director of We See Beauty Foundation. It's based here in Long Island City, so it's very close to my heart. Um, and we uh, develop worker-owned co cooperatives. We're pretty new in the scene, but that's what we do. Anyway, so today we are we are here to, uh, or right now we're here to talk about how cooperatives can be a part of um, larger social justice movements. It's not just about creating a business, a coffee shop, but or whatever, but a means to think about broader questions in our community. Um, my background is in international humanitarian law, and in my experience, I found that um, workplace democracy is a great incubator for larger democratic movements and as a toolkit in peace building. So closer to home, we have um, some fantastic folks here who can talk about how cooperatives are an integral part in the broader movements that they're a part of. So we have Ligia Walpa, who is the executive director of Workers' Justice Project. Ngoc uh, Jung Yo, who is Mekong, uh, with Mekong NYC. Saru uh, Siaf, who is with Make the Road New York. Um, Jessica, man, I forgot your last name. <laughs> Gordon Nembard, sorry, who's a <laughs> professor with CUNY and just wrote a great book um, called uh, Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice, which I believe is for sale outside. Yeah. Go buy it. And then Ed Ott, who is a distinguished lecturer in labor studies at uh, CUNY and uh, is formerly executive director of the New York City Central Labor Council, representing 1.3 million trade unionists from over 400 affiliated organizations. So have at it. Um, I'll try to be short. Um, as uh, my name is Ligia, and um, I'm the director of the Workers Justice Project, which is a um, a worker center that was founded um, in 2010. Was really um, founded to address the exploitation that day laborers uh, and female day laborers faced um, while they're working in underground industries such as house cleaning, um, construction work. And our whole mission is really to empower low-wage immigrant workers, so um, to improve working conditions and really transform um, those industries so it can provide better working conditions and a dignified wage. Um, so we have been uh, very committed to the organizing aspect. Um, we believe that in order for us to transform um, the system, um, uh, exploitative system that exists in different industries, um, we really believe that it's really empowering workers, giving the power to transform that. And organizing has been a powerful tool that we have been doing it through leadership development, um, making sure workers, they start knowing their rights, how to organize, um, and having them to collectively decide what tactics they want to use um, to transform those conditions. Um, in 2010, um, when I was actually hitting the ground, organizing female day laborers in Williamsburg. Um, it was about our idea of really empowering women, right? So how women can really um, take ownership of that collective process and transform what's happening in, 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 in those industries. Um, a lot of the women worked in house cleaning, which is an industry that provides uh, little to no protection, right? Um, sometimes uh, really poor wages that barely can, aff they we really provide them to afford childcare, like you know, basic um, means of survival. Um, and exploitation uh, was a big issue about wage theft. Um, you know, a woman or a, a worker going out to try to earn a ten dollar day pay, not being paid at the end of the day, it was a big issue um, among workers. So when we hit the ground, it was about really organizing and giving workers power to really transform those conditions. And when we started collectively bringing women to um, a meeting space to share those stories and share how they envision organizing and transforming those conditions, there was a lot of conversations about issues that they, they shared commonly among them. One of them was wage theft. One of them was that, you know, they were being forced to clean um, houses on their knees. 
um, you know, exposed to toxic chemicals. Um, but there was a big issue among, among the women was like, well, you know, the reason we're accepting this level of exploitation is because there's few jobs. And we as a community as of workers are competing for those new jobs and the lack of jobs is really forcing us to accept those conditions. Um, I personally didn't have any experience of working cooperatives, um, but our whole idea has been really about giving workers that power to organize. Um, and within that room, we experienced something beautiful was that, yes, women face exploitation, but they already bring a set of experiences and skills from back of their countries. And that room of 20 workers, of women workers, there was actually one of the women that actually have formed a cooperative back in Ecuador. There was other women that have formed cooperatives uh, or was part of a cooperative in California. And the women shift the conversation from from sharing experiences from exploitation to really defining maybe our alternative transformed the, that level of exploitation is really creating something we can own and have control and even set a standards that we consider fair and dignify. So we supported the idea because we have believer that you know workers really decide the process and we really wanna make sure that they own that process and, and go through the organizing because every Every process, it's a growing process where they really build their skills to really define what kind of uh, strategies they want to use. So Apple Eco Cleaning was born out of that organizing process in a street corner right in, in Williamsburg. And our whole idea has been uh, not only making sure women have ownership of their wages and can set standards, but how really women can also be connected to a larger social um, movement, and for us it's about workers' rights, right? It's, yes, there is five, 10, 15 women that are part of this amazing cooperative that are earning a dignified wage, but how we make a deeper connection to really, so they can transform the industry, because the industry, especially the house cleaning industry, is plagued with, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very informal economy where there's multiple employers, <laughs> there is no, s no way of unionizing or creating a standards if it's in a cooperative. So one of the things that we are doing um, now is that th they are not only cooperative members, but they are actually members of a, of a growing organization that is really committed to that mission, to really is transforming the conditions in the house cleaning industry and be empowered as domestic workers. So the cooperative members are not only cooperative, amazing worker owners, but they are leaders of our organization who are also leading that organizing process as how the cooperative is gonna serve as a tool to really educating and engaging employers in a deeper organizing movement. That it's about them being part of, not, offering, not only offering them, but also supporting organizations like ours, whether it's you know being part of an action, whether it's really being part of a rally or supporting something that the workers really believe it's at their heart. Um, something else that we are implementing to make sure the cooperative also is part of this organizing, uh, this organizing work um, is that the leaders are also taking leadership roles to make sure that they are not only being a separate institution, um, but they're also very integral part of, of conducting outreach, um, talking to other members. I think one of the ground rules that the cooperative has exposed that they have to their, their own recruitment. Um, um, of new members and their recruitment happens in a street corner going out and talking to other women, um, talking about their rights, not really sometimes, not all the time, just talking about being a cooperative member, uh, but how they as, as, as women, as domestic workers can really start thinking about organizing. Um, and so we're, as an organization, we're really committed to make sure that the cooperative grows uh, in, a, in a very you know, healthy, very sustainable, um, democratic workplace, but it's also deeply connected with with organizing and really transforming um, the exploitative conditions in the house cleaning. And so, are actually part of a growing, beautiful movement of domestic workers. Um, al all the members have actually participated with other organizations, and one of them is like you know there is a New York um, domestic workers coalition here in New York City that is form of uh, beautiful uh, uh, movement of organizations or worker centers of domestic workers here in New York to really start thinking about how we're gonna transform that industry. And for us, um, 
you know, how we can implement basic protection. And for us, the cooperative is a way of creating those uh, standards, such as a tool for really organizing and transforming the, the exploitative industries, um, such as the house cleaning work. Um, hi everyone, good evening. Um, my name is Tran, I also go by Ngoc Tran Vu, and I work as an organizer with Mekong NYC, and we're an organization based in the Bronx that works with the Southeast Asian community, primarily Cambodians and Vietnamese. And um, we've been there since the 80s, but we're very much an invisible community um, that not a lot of people know about. And um, a lot of our community member faces issues of poverty, unemployment, lack of formal education, illiteracy. So um, yeah, it's, it can be a very tough um, environment to, um, to work with. And, and one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is how do we create opportunities within our communities and not just on a personal individual basis, but, on a, but as a collective. And um, we, in the three areas of strands that we work with is community organizing, advocacy, and arts and culture. And so in this conversation of how do we create opportunity and also sustain um, opportunity for our communities um, where the capital we remains in our community and it doesn't you know, leave, how do we create structures for that? We've been thinking about the, this idea of having a worker cooperative in incubating one. We've been working with Center for Family Life and helping us develop it. And I mean, I, I always come to this phrase, um, a, hung, a hungry belly has no ears. And it's, it's very much true in that sense when our com communities are struggling with so many issues, especially as a refugee and immigrant community, issues of migration, displacement, trauma from war, psychological, mental, there's through like different languages, generationals, um, all these are very real issue. In the midst of all this, how do we create opportunity for our community to not only survive, but grow and flourish. And so, um, so we've, we've been discussing around this idea of um, a workers cooperative. And, and truth be told, um, we, we also question about what it means to, um, to live in this capitalistic society. And a workers cooperative is still participating in that model when you think about it. Um, it's an alternative, but we're still, um, existing within this capital and using that. So how do we, um, you know, work around that? I mean, wha what we see the workers cooperative model is being a very empowering process of having choices where a lot of our community members didn't have that, um, especially having a voice in, in the type of environment that they wanna be in, the type of work, the type of labor. A lot of our community members um, have skills that are oftentimes undervalued in this capitalistic society. And so we, we often talked about um, how do we create opportunity for them to advance, for them to develop their skills to create work that, that does value them. And how do we create this environment overall of valuing, valuing everyone, especially in the workplace, of everyone's <coughs> voice being heard, um, and everyone not just even having a vote, you know, that the whole buzzword of democracy in the workplace, but what about an environment where everyone is truly valued? That's one of the things that we talk about in this, this process of like politicizing ourselves and our community. Um, how do we create, create that process for ourselves and live that? Um, so that's just some of the things that um, our communities um, talk about through this, I think very revolutionary act of creating this type of environment that we wanna see for ourselves in the process of being very dehumanized, I think, um, in, even in like the refugee resettlement, just the type of environment that and issues that we're facing. <coughs> and um, I think the idea of having choices for ourselves and <coughs> the empowerment of that um, is something that is very much rooted in, in our communities in the process of organizing ourselves. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Sadaf. Um, I'm with a nonprofit community-based organization called Make the Road New York. Um, we are located in three of the five boroughs of the city. Um, we are in Jackson Heights, um, in Queens, in Bushwick, in Brooklyn, and Port Richmond, Staten Island. We are a membership organization, um, and we have over 15,000 members from across the city. 
Um, our members are um, working class, uh, predominantly immigrant um, workers um, and families throughout New York. Um, and we are a place, uh, our offices are very much like community centers where people come together and talk about a variety of issues and we do organizing around uh, multi-issues such as housing, um, such as immigration rights, um, education. Um, we, uh, we have a group that organizes uh, LGBTQ immigrant New Yorkers and we also do a lot of youth organizing as well. Um, and so uh, our model is kind of to do organizing in all of in a variety of areas that, that affect the lives of, of working class and immigrant New Yorkers, um, but at the same time provide a variety of services in those areas to address the immediate needs um, of, of, in particular, immigrants uh, in the city. And so we provide a variety of services for, um, for legal services, health services, um, workforce services, and, um, and adult education services. Um, and so the strategies that we employ in our organization um, are a lot of organizing campaigns around those variety of issues um, where workers come together, talk about what they're facing, identify the issues, they come up with the solutions uh, and lead our campaigns to drive changes in those policy areas. Um, and we've uh, had a lot of successful victories in a variety of issues surrounding that. Um, most recently with municipal IDs in the city. Um, we've done a, a lot around wage theft for workers um, and um, have campaigns around uh, um, minimum wage and living wage. Um, and those are just some examples. Another strategy we employ is working with union partners um, for organizing campaigns. And, and we work to unionize right now car wash workers um, with the retail wholesale department store union. Um, but a third strategy, which is really important, um, and I think where worker co-ops come in, is in a strategy that's around building alternatives to the issues that we face. And uh, I think we've tried this in certain areas where we've, we've uh, worked to build an alternative school uh, in Brooklyn, um, the Brooklyn School for Social Justice. Um, at one point, we had um, a CSA. Um, and so uh, this worker co-op project that, that we formed and we received technical assistance with Center for Family Life um, is also part of that, um, I think, um, kind of solution to build alternatives in the here and now that one, address immediate concerns like our services do, um, but that also combine that with actual organizing in terms of building leadership uh, with our members. That's something that is transformative in people's daily lives. Um, and the, the members in those co-ops, um, similar to what Lee Hill was saying, they participate in our broader campaigns and the organization going on. And so to see that connection um, is really beautiful. Um, and so, um, you know, we see, we see that we had one member who's part of our co-op, for example, who originally came to Make the Road uh, for, um, for English classes, then got connected to uh, uh, lawyers after learning about uh, wage, uh, wage theft in the, in the, her rights as an undocumented immigrant worker um, got connected to legal services um, to address her individual case where she worked at a restaurant for three years, was paid 20 bucks a day, um, and not given overtime. Um, and so um, af after we launched the co-op, there was actually a beautiful moment where we had um, a protest in front of her old restaurant and co-op members came, as well as the workers from our workers committee came to support her. And um, just the connection between what she had experienced and what she was able to, to do moving forward um, was really great to see. So we see it as, um, as a uh, worker co-ops as really important, uh, really important solution for our communities um, and a really important key part in, in um, for us to be able to engage in um, kind of the fight also for a new economy um, and for uh, one based on cooperation and solidarity and to get involved in that as well. Um, and as an organization that's been around in our communities for over 15 years, uh, raising, elevating the voice of immigrant workers um, we've also established, um, you know, a variety of um, political connections and ties um, that, you know, 
we we would like to also bring into to the advocacy effort efforts around co-op development um, and so that's also been happening this year and has been really exciting to see and, and be a part of with other groups and co-op developers around the city. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Jessica Gordon, I'm hard. So I am a social justice baby. Um, I was actually, my mother went into labor one July night in the 1950s after coming home from an organizing meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, and I grew up in the black liberation movement, the movement against war and nuclear weapons, the women's movement, human rights in general, et cetera. Um, and I learned at my dinner table, my family dinner table, how important economic rights, economic justice, economic democracy was to these movements. That in fact we couldn't really make progress in those movements without the economic justice part. And so um, I actually chose for my profession economics because I wanted to find the economic solution because in so many cases economics is the oppressive, the problem, right? And I wanted to find a way to make economics liberatory and uh, to find the solutions, right? So uh, I became an economist and then I luckily found the solidarity economy, uh, economy co-ops, worker co-ops. So I have sort of a list here. Um, when they told me I only had five minutes, I decided I better write it down so I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> So my list here is that you can't have social or political justice without economic justice. It's the justices are hollow without the economic piece. Um, worker co-ops, I think, are probably the most democratic economic institutions that we have. Um, not the only ones, but one of the most democratic. Why? Because uh, the for-profit investor-owned companies are really a black box, right? They're allowed Anything can happen in there. In fact, you're supposed to leave your humanity, your justice out the do outside the door when you enter um, as a wage laborer, when you enter an investor-owned corporation, right? Even though, you know, in church or at home, we're taught about how to help each other and how to be human beings, right? But when we get in the economic arena, we're supposed to forget all that. And so <sighs> worker-owned co-ops are a way to counteract that, right? We spend, think about it, we spend at least 40 hours, maybe more, at work. The only other thing we probably spend more time at is sleeping, if those of us who do get some sleep, right? So if we're not doing democracy in our work hours, then we're not practicing democracy in most of our life. But a worker co-op allows us to actually practice that democracy in those 40 plus hours that we're spending trying to make a living, right? But not only does it allow us to practice democracy, but it allows us to democratize the way we work, to democratize the decision making, and to actually create a living, both generate income and create some assets, right? Which are the part that make it liberatory in addition, right? Because it's not just that you get to make decisions about things, but you actually own it, right? So then your decisions stick, but also that ownership gives you some kind of stability and some kind of way to actually build wealth, which in the end is what will liberate us. Um, be a, a member, therefore, of a worker co-op provides us first education, right, to equalize knowledge because the only way we can participate democratically in our co-op is if knowledge is equalized in some way or at least shared. It gives us that voice, right, the shop floor voice, but also the governance voice, input in policy. Again, where else do we really get that, right? In the political arena, if we don't have enough money to buy the candidate, our little one vote at, you know, every four years doesn't do that much. But here again in our worker co-op, every single day we're doing this, putting a policy, putting ideas into practice, sharing ideas, coming together with other people to make the right choices that will help everybody. We get leadership development. A lot of people have talked about that already, so I won't talk about that as much, but that agency, responsibility, and accountability that comes from that is so important, not just in the co-op itself, but that's gonna c help us in the rest of the world, right? And other things that we do in life, those things are gonna be helpful. 
the transparency in the co-op, right? Remember, in co-ops, we have to know what's going on in order to make the choices as a democratic group. We usually have open books. We learn how to read those books. We share those books. Again, that transparency, we're going to expect it in the rest of the world. That's what's going to help us with social justice. And then the social capital that we develop, obviously, the teamwork, the networking, the social energy that we put into productivity and into making our co-op work will also get us through um, in the rest of the work we do. So those are the elements, I think, of social justice. And as I said, we get to practice them all the time, 40 hours a week. Um, and otherwise, we don't really get, even as I said with politics and even social justice, we don't get that combination, right, of the economic liberation and these policy practical activities of um, democracy. And finally, um, oh, I guess I said this already. I was going to say the income generation and asset ownership. I also grew up in a family um, that was very class conscious and understood that, again, we in if everybody, unless everybody was prosperous, all of us were poor. And so worker co-ops, again, help to provide a solution to that, right? Figuring out a way to share money, to share profits, to share decision-making about money, and ultimately to develop wealth and prosperity for everybody, that community solution. And I'll end with um, a quote by Fannie Lou Hamer, which, of course, I can't remember the exact quote, but I'll give you the, <laughs> the uh, notion of it. Those of you know Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Um, one of my sheroes. Uh, most people know her because she was a voting rights activist and a civil rights activist co-founder of the Freedom, Mrs. Democratic Freedom, Miss, oh God, Mississippi Freedom Democratic <laughs> Party, thank you, which is its 40 year anniversary this year. But she also was a co-op advocate, especially after that. By the 70s, she actually started her own co-op. And why did she start her own co-op? Because she said it was impossible to be a political activist and not have economic independence. Because if you do your civil rights, your political work, they can retaliate economically. They'll fire you, they'll throw you off the land, whatever. You have to own your own land, create your own food, uh, have your own independent economic institutions. And how do you do that? The only way that makes sense for black liberation or anybody's liberation is to do it as a collective, cooperatively, because then you serve the whole community, not just individuals. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Ed Ott. Uh, I've been active in the labor union movement of this city for over 45 years. And most of my experience in dealing with worker issues are through that filter, um, but not exclusively. Uh, I spent the better part of the last 12 years in the labor council trying to struggle with collaborations between unions and other forms of worker organizations. Uh, among those organizations were worker centers, but groups like the Taxi Workers Alliance uh, did some very inspired work, inspiring to me, with the domestic workers uh, and various other organizations in the city. Uh, my basic m operational framework is there is no one-size-fits-all uh, when it comes to improving the lives of working people, <coughs> and that we have to be open to, to new forms and new experiences. Uh, the labor unions have had a long history um, in this country, as have worker cooperatives. Uh, worker cooperatives were really active and strong component of the working class movement in the 19th century, particularly post-Civil War, uh, among agricultural workers. And it's a pity we didn't get to hear more because her whole work is in the book. Like, is in the book. <laughs> um, but not exclusively agricultural workers. They met much opposition from capital. The railroads used to work overtime to crush some of the farmer cooperatives. Uh, they were n very, very um, opposed by forms of finance capital. Uh, and those issues will remain, and I'll, I'll get into them in, in about two minutes. But I wanted to um, just bounce off something. Co-ops, the, the cornerstone principle, and it came up in the panels before lunch, uh, this notion of worker ownership, uh, worker management, uh, worker operation, if you will, and this notion of one person, one vote, uh, which I find to be uh, inspiring 
but a couple of questions had come up in the panel just before lunch, which I think can be helpful. The unions went through a process uh, on paper, and if you talk to your average active unionist, your union leader, they are worker organizations. But the truth of the matter is, um, many unions have evolved into something else. They are organizations where workers are members and other people service their needs. And part of that, part of that, comes out of the exhaustive experience of work. Uh, and that time, and it came up in the earlier panel ab about workers, when it comes time to do the work of the co-op, um, they don't have the hours, or they feel like they don't have the hours. And there's a constant struggle to keep people involved, not just in the capital monetary commitment to the co-op, but also in the participation of the actual running of the co-op. There's a cautionary tale in the history of the union movement in that. And that it was too often the participatory part breaks down and others are more than willing to become the leader. So the unions just knocked them on their butts. They changed from organizations that were worker organizations to organizations that service workers and something dramatic was lost. The average workplace is run by coercion. The experience of people's working lives is your last free day is the day when you say, I want the job, and they say you're hired. And then you do what you're told when you're told, or you're out. That builds in to working lives. A fear, a intuitive sense of how the game is supposed to be played. And then you get an owner, and that question came up uh, before lunch. We have, I think the woman said, we have four partners in a, a limited liability corporation. We want to turn it into a co-op. We have about 40 employees. They're resistant. Yeah, they're resistant. Their whole life, um, they've been un they have understood that all of those basic freedoms that some people assume they have outside the workplace, your average worker knows does not exist in the workplace. The Constitution of the United States does not extend the notion of free speech, the notion of initiative. In most workplaces, initiative is seditious and treated accordingly. So when we make this transition and the co-op movement needs to grow, it's part of the solution on the wage question. It becomes part of the solution on family wealth which for a component of the union movement, they understood very well. In this country, they used discriminatory methods to enforce it, but the skilled trades understood. It wasn't about having a job. It was not even about having a career. It's about building family wealth, which is why they attempted to pass it on. The family becomes the economic unit that you pass the, the work onto. Three generations of that, you have a very different family. For the co-ops, that potential is there. That potential for a family to accumulate not just a job's wage, but wealth is very different and empowering and potentially liberating. But the workforce that we're gonna draw down on for these co-ops, the notion of education and re-education and positive reinforcement needs to be an integral part of the work of the co-op movement because the workforce is crippled. The workplace has been taught to be a place where you don't take initiative. The entrepreneurial skills that it takes to get a co-op going are forced out of kids very quickly in schools and, and reinforced messages in the workplace. Another barrier. Part of the work that I do now and I did when I was at the Central Labor Council, we had our own workforce arm. We did workforce training, the Consortium for Worker Education. There are enormous resources in this state for businesses to train, retrain, educate workers. The co-op movements are gonna have to struggle to get that component to understand, and groups like Make the Road do terrific work in the workforce area. It's gonna be a struggle to get co-ops to be treated like any other business. When it comes time to upgrade, recapitalize, we have new software we have to train our workforce on. 
that money has to be there for these enterprises. And that's going to be part of the struggle. But you, as you develop your co-op's plan, as you plan to expand, draw down on those resources that exist. There are tens of millions of dollars in this city for businesses to improve their workforce. And that becomes part of the education process that you can also draw down on to overcome some of the barriers where workers are willing to really be a full co-op member and not some kind of side partner. This is not the Park Slope Food Co-op. And we're going to have to do a massive education job on that. Lastly, one of the other barriers, that, and I can see it already coming up as I am beginning to learn more and more about the co-op movement, the financial institutions don't get it. And there's going to be a need in this state to create a state bank whose mission is to fund alternative enterprise. <laughs> and, and that's going to be a struggle, and I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we have about 10 minutes for questions before the next panel. Um, so may I have you in front? Buenas tardes. Otra vez de nuevo. Yo soy muy inquieta. Primero felicito a las personas que organizaron este evento, que lo sigan haciendo, y también a los que han expuesto ahí su conocimiento. Pero yo tengo alguna preocupación. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone who put this together. Um, I very, very much enjoy having all the knowledge. But I have a few questions. Más que una pregunta, son varias reflexiones. Yo tengo experiencia en cooperativismo de más de 20 años. More than a question, it's actually some reflections. I have experience in cooperativism for more than 20 years. En República Dominicana. In Dominican Republic. No podemos perder de vista los principios básicos del cooperativismo, eh, solidaridad y compañerismo. We can't lose sight of um, the principles of cooperativism, which is solidarity and uh, peer, like that peer ledness. En un video que anda por ahí lo tiene Omar y no sé quién más decían la persona de Mondragón, una cooperativa de Europa que antes de formar cooperativa, hay que ser cooperativista. There's a video that Omar is showing, and I, I don't know where it's right now, but um, the, someone from Mondragon, was, was, which is a cooperative in Europe, they were saying um, that, uh, that, the, that you can't, you have to, before having a cooperative, you have to be uh, cooperativist? Cooperativista. <laughs> Sentirla de corazón. Feeling it from the heart. Porque yo estoy, soy de Comundo, habemos cuatro compañeras en Manhattan de limpieza, Comundo Cleaner. Pero algunas compañeras, miembros, yo solo oigo aquí trabajadores, trabajadores, trabajadores. Somos miembros, somos socios, se preocupan. Digo, sé, ¿cuánto voy a cobrar? No, ¿cómo voy a hacer crecer mi negocio? Yo felicitaba ahorita a la joven Yadira. Teresa, sorry, porque ella habla mi negocio. Y así debemos de hablar los cooperativistas. And um, I'm here with some of my peers from Eco, Eco Mundo uh, Cleaning in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, one of the things is that we struggle is sometimes wondering how much we are going to charge, how much we're going to get paid. And I was, I was talking with the compañera here, Teresa. I, I would appreciate what the compañera Teresa was saying. Uh, in the sense that she was saying that she was taking ownership and she was saying my business and no fue por casualidad que la alcaldía aprobó el 1.2 millones para las cooperativas es que nosotros le estamos resolviendo parte del problema del desempleo so it's no wonder that the the city approved the 1.2 million uh, to develop the cooperatives because we're actually solving an employment problem. Y la pregunta va ahora. Alguien me la contestó, pero yo. And here's the question. Somebody answered, but I still want to ask it. ¿Qué institución regula las cooperativas a nivel de Estados Unidos o a nivel de Nueva York? 
En República Dominicana la regula una institución del gobierno, se llama IDECOP, pero las cooperativas tenemos leyes internas de nosotros, pero ese organismo se encarga de que todas caminen por un solo nivel. Aquí no sé. So my, so my question is, what organism uh, 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 rules over cooperatives in the U.S. and also in New York? Because in the Dominican Republic, we have um, an organism called IDECOP, and each or each cooperative has their own internal laws, but IDECOP regulates the the larger or, um, organ the, the larger the larger laws around co uh, cooperatives. Gracias. Thank you. Well, in the U.S., we don't really have that same kind of system. So we have state laws. Some states have co-op laws. Um, there are some federal laws for credit unions, but not for co-op businesses. So it's very uneven. We have co-op trade associations, but they're not federal regulators. So the only real regulator we have is the IRS, who does it through tax law. I don't know if any. Yeah, I think that part of it's kind of a blessing and kind of a curse right now because of w the stage that the co-op movement is here, that there's not a ruling agency, but every enterprise is going to come up against a, a series of local, state, and federal laws, regulations, mostly tax laws. Let's not pretend they don't exist, um, but others that are going to impact the ability of the business to function as a, as a co-op at times. Uh, the big problem I think we're going to have, uh, and I'm not going to just include government agencies in this, but even some like labor organizations, they don't, they don't really understand the difference between a co-op and any other enterprise. And so w some of this stuff is going to have to be navigated. Omar's here. He, he can tell you about regulations in this city and the area that he's working on. Um, it can be torturous. You, sir, in the back. Me too. Uh, in the last 10, 20 years, one of, if not the fastest growing sectors of the economy has been the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, some of the most exploited workers I know are staff people, particularly organizers, at nonprofit organizations <laughs> that work 60, 60 hours a week on very low wages until they're burnt out and they're basically disposable workers and their work is not considered professional or valued in any way. I went to an economic development conference of a major national nonprofit organization in this country that gets $200 million a year from Congress. And at their economic development training, one of the activities was around bringing a McDonald's into a low-income neighborhood as a means of economic development. When I said, by what stretch of the imagination is this economic development, people looked at me like I was from Mars. Um, I think we also need to include in this conversation the role of nonprofits in economic development um, and the discussion about how do you expand a co-op movement so that we can also create cooperative nonprofits and address the issue of how do we deal with um, a, a sector whose funding is completely controlled by either government, corporations, or giant private foundations, many of whom are the very same people that are causing the problems that we're trying to fight and solve. I think we need to include this in the conversation. Uh, yeah, thank you for those comments. I uh, totally agree, and as someone who works within the nonprofit industrial complex um, and have for many years, uh, I think the reason that I decided to go that route um, was just because of the realization and understanding that there are a lot of really incredible organizing projects that are actually coming out, and that there's, you know, there's the social justice fighting organizations, and then there's service-based nonprofits, and there's a huge distinction between those, but then also there are similar problems um, as well. So um, just being conscious of, of all of that, but trying to work within that framework to actually 
um, do something innovative to reach populations that no other uh, place and, and that unions are not reaching and as unions are dying um, to, to be part of an organization that is actually building a base um, and that cares about building leadership and giving voices to workers who are extremely marginalized, extremely exploited in the low wage industries that they're working in, the industries that are not unionized, um, that no one's paying any attention to. And so while I understand all of those problems and issues, um, for me it's, um, it's been about kind of uh, utilizing the nonprofit structure uh, and its ability to, to reach communities, um, its ab ability to have a reputation and create safe spaces for people and communities to come together. And uh, yes, they might be limited by that structure itself, um, but I think the hope is that in building leadership, something happens beyond that, something grows beyond that. Um, and it, you know that we contribute to something beyond that. Um, but I also agree with everything related to the nonprofit industrial complex as well. <laughs> oh yeah, and thanks for saying that about the potential of nonprofits. I just wanted to mention that one of the organizations I'm a member of, Grassroots Economic Organizing, we have an online newsletter, geo.coop. We actually organized a session on the nonprofit industrial complex and cooperatives in Boston at the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, what, two years ago or something? And actually had a good showing, though we also had a lot of people who um, thought we were being unfair in that mm -hmm. configuration. We were trying to talk about just those kind of things and also the tensions between worker co-ops that are actually organized by nonprofits and have to be beholden to some of those things rather, other than, rather than organically developed worker co-ops. So I think it's important. I think actually about an hour ago, some of us were saying we need to redo that workshop and have more discussions about that. I mean, I'm also really glad you brought up that point because it's very true about the non-profit um, industrial complex. There are so many um, guidelines, especially when it comes to grants and um, things that we have to adhere by, and, and also that issue of external outsider versus insider, and like where this money coming from, and where, and how certain nonprofit have to adhere by certain thing and change themselves in the process just so they can fit that funding criteria. And so, at least for Mekong, that's what we prompted us to start thinking about other alternative. How do we sustain ourselves in the long run internally? How do we be independent? How do we create um, different options for our community members. And um, with Mekong, at least, is we're trying to incubate and we're trying to develop a workers' cooperative, but by no means are we, um, yeah, I mean, we want, we're working with community members so that the eventual goal is so they could, you know, do this themselves and they don't no longer use and need us as a resource, but we are there to help um, support. And even some of our staff are potential, you know, co-op members. We're we're the ones that are living in the communities ourselves. But I think that issue of um, the nonprofit industrial complex is definitely a big one, I think, in this whole social justice world. And is our model to rely on these um, industries? And what is that our eventual goal to liberate ourselves? And how do we go about that? I think that's a good point. Yeah. I, I just wanted to like add to that, not only that I shared what was shared by my colleagues. And I think that's, that's something that um, not all nonprofits are dealing in, in having an internal discussion as how we deal with with that you know with the, those industries as we are trying to build a movement of social justice and also a new form of economy that it's based on dignity uh, and justice and um, in our case I'm just going to share about workers justice project we are a, um, a small very dynamic organization that was uh, born dynamically um, and that's a question that we are constantly asking uh, ourselves as, you know, source of funding and um, how we grow and really achieve our mission, um, but making sure that we are also following up principles of, you know, of solidarity and making sure that we are really moving in a very healthy and way in really building communities that are really building power. Um, and it's a question, and I, I think one of the interesting questions that we, we are having also, it's like, you know, how we create also cooperatives that are funding this social justice movement. Um, not only cooperatives that are bringing justice to workers, 
but a cooperative that is really helping to build the social movement. And it's a question that we are constantly asking ourselves and, and kind of rethinking and, 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 and strategizing about it. So, and, and I know it's not only um, us thinking, but I know that there is many other organizations that are thinking about how this cooperative infrastructures can serve um, as a support system for social justice movements. Great. All right, we, since we started a little late, we'll take one more question. How many more? Oh, five more minutes of questions. So we can take more than one. Um, you, sir. Uh, yeah, I just want to, I totally agree with this gentleman back here. Uh, but I, uh, corporations are corporations. How they distribute their profits is a whole other can of worms. And so if you go into business as a, in, a, in a traditional corporate structure, you are, I mean, the, the term nonprofit is really a misnomer. Corporations need to make a profit. The, the question becomes how they distribute their profits. And nonprofits, uh, so-called nonprofits, 501c3 corps, are supposed to distribute their profits for uh, some kind of a social justice mission. Some of them do and do a great job, and some of them are terrible, and basically it's a, a shell to pay a nice salary to some executive director or the founder. And if anybody has any comments, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> All right, a question then. <laughs> Look, the whole hospital, voluntary hospital industry in this town is a so-called nonprofit. When I was a glassware washer in 1969, I would order glassware from the best price I could get, and every order got diverted to Fisher Scientific. One day I happened to be looking at the list of who was on the board of the hospital, Fisher Scientific. Um, a whole lot of people get fat off the nonprofit industry. So yeah, I would agree with you. It's about, the, the, the model is the same, and working for a nonprofit can be as dehumanizing and disempowering. There is a potential in the nonprofit movement that's in struggle, there's certain reasons why they opt for the nonprofit form, uh, but that comes with a lot of restrictions. Uh, the old Central Labor Council decided not to take a nonprofit form because they didn't want to be told what to do. So th they didn't take other money. But look, for organizations on the ground, there are limits. No one gives you $300,000 a year without strings. They have a mission. They're giving you the money for a reason. Uh, I can't remember which one it was, but one of the Afghan Mujahideen organizations once said the thing that really got them angry at the United States and Europe was that they would always give them enough money to keep them in the war, but never enough to win. I just can I ask, ask something quick. I think one of the things um, when we looked at the nonprofit industry is like we, we often don't think about how how and what was the goal of its creation. I think um, when we rely on yeah communities to take care of so many different issues, where does that leave room for the government, for example, the role of um, government? Like, um, we're supposed to provide advocacy work, direct service, all these things, but where does that leave room for the role of the government exactly? I think oftentimes we don't question that. And um, I mean, one other thing is that with the whole uh, nonprofit, we are, we're oftentimes fighting against each other for resources that are very limited. And so that creates this other barrier of competition <laughs> amongst even community groups ourselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Ma'am? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, we're, we're also a worker center. We're a 501c3. So, uh, yeah, I think the nonprofit industrial complex is trying to derail, derail the real movement for social justice. And sadly, uh, there are many big uh, 501c3s that are falling into the trap. So uh, those uh, organizations that are well, you know, uh, whose organizers and executive directors are well paid are, I think, sadly, falling into that track. And I just want to uh, make a comment to what the brother said about uh, those organizers that are working 60 hours a week and are severely underpaid because I belong to that group. I think. I think uh, we should uh, commend uh, those organizers. 
I think those are the groups that, you know, get funding based on, you know, what their missions are and are really willing to uh, work very hard, you know, uh, to achieve their missions. I think we should get more of those organizers, find more of those organizers. I came from a country, the Philippines, you know, where there's a very strong movement and we were not paid when we were organizing there. Maybe those organizers could organize themselves as a union. <laughs> I know, I, I uh, had friends at Center for Constitutional Rights and they unionized a while back, it was a good job. All right, final one, last question, ma'am. Press the button and speak into the mic, please. <laughs> ah, thank you. Uh, I think, um, I, I, I'm thinking about the history of the United States and our involvement in the destruction of co-ops, the history of the, I don't mean our, the history of the United States government's involvement in the destruction of co-ops, the um, Contra War in Nicaragua, whose <coughs> main activity seems to have been murdering co-op farmers are one of the main ones. And the, uh, I overheard uh, Dr. Nemhart talking earlier today about how it is that the huge, massive organizing of co-ops in the South by civil rights work workers and other activists was often defeated by the state violence. So um, I guess I'm asking whether people have given further thought to, besides the, on, at the economic level, how do we defend the nascent co-op movement, the tiny co-op movement we have in the US. I mean, maybe it's bigger than most people realize, but it's still tiny. Um, and how do we, um, uh, how, do, how do we prevent it being defeated politically and how do we prevent it being defeated uh, militarily, the way the Occupy movement was just defeated militarily by simple, easy, centrally organized, as physical assaults. Great question. Um, I, don't, I hate for us to end on a, a sorry sad about note, that. so I'll try to. Uh, I I'll could ask a different question if right, you want. No, I'll, I have I'll, two or three. I'll try to talk about the successes um, that I found. <laughs> so the co-ops that were successful, the very first thing that defended them was their community, their surrounding communities. Yeah. Right? So even now in the 20th and 21st century, a lot of the co-op stories are about not just what co-op members did and how they came together, but also the solidarity within the community to make sure those co-ops happen, to make sure sometimes it's um, putting in the extra fundraising or the f physically using their bodies to protect a space or that kind of thing. So I think that connection to community is really essential and all this, and the co-ops I know that have thrived in addition to having really good education among their members has also had really good relations with their community and the community has protected them both economically and um, physically. So I would say that's a really major piece. And then I think the getting co-ops, the interlocking co-ops so that there's a much stronger economic foundation of co-ops working with each other, supplying each other, et cetera, they're much less vulnerable that way. But also, ideally, when you, the more and more co-ops that you have building on each other, the more and more assets you can create that can actually take over the political, at least the local political system, and then run their own systems. Um, it's an interesting question, I think, for, um, for me, especially where, um, uh, as part of a worker center that is organizing low-wage immigrant workers. Um, because I, as we went through the process of supporting um, amazing leaders to form the cooperative, we came to realize that the US actually lacks an uh, infrastructure system to actually support this workforce that, it's, that are working in underground economies that provides the worst of the worst working conditions. Um, so we, we as as as, an, uh, as community organizations, um, we are trying to figure it out. We we haven't even figured out how are we going to defend it in a policy making way because we are 
really trying to figure out how we can create infrastructures, the system in place that supports the growth of cooperative um, of cooperatives among immigrant workers that work in, in underground economies that really barely provide little protection and opportunities for this workforce. Um, and the other one I think I also, it came to my mind, is like we are already building not only worker owners, uh, especially um, I think the topic is, you know, how cooperatives are linked with social justice movements. Um, and there is a lot of cooperatives here that are already part of organizations that are, are visioning creating a social movement. Uh, um, and we are building leaders that are conscious and advocators, not only for, for their own cooperative, but to be a voice for this movement and to stand up and, 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 and be leaders to really fight back. So we are already creating uh, militants um, that, are, that will be ready for that fight when it comes. I have one. Right. Uh, sorry, one last comment I wanted to make that I was also thinking about as Ligia was speaking. Um, that there's a potential with co-ops that I think is something really important, which is that co-ops you can form uh, in a variety of industries, in any industry, low wage, uh, middle wage, high wage uh, industries. Um, they're being formed in with a variety of different uh, populations and groups. Um, and I think that there's a lot of potential uh, in terms of building more um, in a variety of areas and connecting groups that are otherwise not connected and disconnected um, that come together based on these prin common principles of cooperation and solidarity. So it has this potential across class, across industries. That's nice. Um, I, I'll be very brief. I think there's two pressures that are more dangerous than some of the state police kind of things. One, the market pressures. And most small businesses fail because they start out undercapitalized. Right. And we don't have a great source of capital. That problem has to be solved. That's why right. I was talking before about, you know, in Philadelphia, some of the co-op people are talking about trying to get a municipal bank, right. state banks. Right. Uh, we have to solve that problem or a lot of us die on the vine. Right. So it's just something to think about. Can you say a spec more about why state or municipal rather than cooperative uh, That's banks? A whole weekend. Okay, <laughs> see you then. Thank you all for participating and to the participants themselves.